Hello and welcome to the programme in which I travel to meet the most remarkable people in the Asia-Pacific and beyond. It's been lovely program. meeting you. you. We spend time with the biggest names in Hollywood and the legends of Indian cinema too. I love you. You're here talking to me, aren't you? We see a different private side to public lives, whether it's touring the outback with Australia's top singing group or playing beach cricket with Dennis Lilly, arguably the greatest fast bowler of all time. Over square leg. Four. Three group takeoff. We get to know the Asia Pacific's most influential business leaders, spend time with royal families, and discover the people making the Asia Pacific the most dynamic region on earth. It's all part of an uh, overall master plan. It's a nice personal touch. It is a nice touch. <laughs> this week I'm in the King's Road in London. It's one of the most fashionable streets in the world. There are restaurants and shops everywhere. Now, the man I've come to meet has played a huge part in changing international attitudes to Indian cooking. He's won more international awards than any other Indian chef. Vineet Bhatia is very probably the most critically acclaimed Indian chef in the world. In the last few years, he's set up 12 restaurants in several different countries with more on the way. And he's one of the very few chefs of any kind to have won Michelin stars in more than one country. I work extremely hard. I would put in three months, three and a half months in a row, seven days, yeah. 17, 18 hours a day, because I wanted to succeed. From the background I have come, I've always struggled to showcase what I wanted to do. It's the range and quality of the restaurants in London, and indeed the whole of Britain now, that really takes the eye. There was a time when British food was almost the stuff of ridicule, but those days are long gone. Even out of the way, country pubs now serve world-class menus. When I first met up with Vineet in Chelsea, the first thing I discovered was that he is wonderfully unpretentious and that being a chef was never really his first career choice. As a child, he'd been obsessed with aircraft. We lived near the airport. Right. So when the plane flew at 6.30 in the morning on a daily basis, I knew that was my sound to get up. Right. So I should get up the sound of the engines coming in. I was thought that might put you off plane. No, 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 I just loved it. Yeah? Loved the sound, the engines, the roar, it just got me going. It gave me a big rush. Right. And we used to go to school, cycle to school, through the aerodrome, my brother and I, and we would watch the planes being uh, in the hangars there, the choppers, and we were just in awe. And we would leave school by two in the afternoon, and it was a hot summer day. We used to go in the hangars, the security guards knew us. This was way back in the uh, late 70s. There was no security there as such. We used to go in to drink water. But the real thing was to look at the engines and the planes in the hangars. So that was always behind my mind to be a pilot. So and what went wrong? I could not get through to my defense services in India. You couldn't get into the I defense force? I couldn't get it. They offered me army and they offered me navy. And I said, no, I want to fly. I don't want to go in the army or the navy. I want to be a pilot. So it was a bit of a letdown. Why did they say no to Because you? I was short in my height. Too yeah. short to be a pilot? Yes, by, I didn't know you had to be. a couple of centimeters. So I lost out. I didn't know that you had to be a certain height to be a pilot. I can understand it maybe in the infantry. I have but no I idea why. But it'd be more it, comfortable in the... That's what they told me. You cannot get into the Air Force because of certain restrictions. And I said, okay, in that case, I will not join the army. And I actually went into textile designing for a week in Bombay. And I went in there and that was not my cup of Darjeeling at all. I just, not your cup of Darjeeling. Not at all. <laughs> I had cotton in my eyes, my nose, my ears, everywhere. And I said, this is not. I can't stand in the lathe machine doing cotton work. And when I went into hotel school, I never wanted to be a cook. I wanted to be a barman. I wanted to mix drinks. Okay. I wanted to watch people enjoy. And I remember in 85, I went to the Oberoi's for a training through my college in Bombay. And they saw me and they said, uh, we don't have a vacancy in the bar because you have to be six feet high. Oh, so it's your height again that was okay. the problem. It was the problem. <laughs> so I said, OK, I need to work. As a trainee, what do I do? They said, we put in the kitchen and we take it from there. And I said, not the kitchen. I said, OK. I walked in the kitchen and that changed my life. I have still to see a kitchen like that, so immaculately run, so much discipline in the place and so much commitment in the staff. Used to get up in the morning, go to work. At my seven o'clock, you all stand in a big line, the chef would come, they would check your nails, they would check your hair, they would check your scarf, they check your shoes. And if you're not dressed up, they send you back. Go, get dressed and come back. So it's, right, like, so it's almost like an army it's discipline. Like, an army. like a military. I, I loved and you loved discipline. it. I loved it. 
And I said, you know what, I want to be a cook. So if you were a couple of centimetres taller... I wouldn't be a chef. You, you wouldn't be a chef? I would be a fighter pilot. The idea was to... Or a barman. Or a barman. But I, no, if I was a little taller, I would be an astronaut for sure. Because final aim was to go into space. Right. And be an astronaut. We were headed towards the restaurant that made his international career take off, at any rate. We were walking through the back streets of Chelsea towards another surprise. In London, the only two addresses you have to remember, there is 10 Downing Street yes. and there's 10 Lincoln Street. That's oh, oh that, that's it. <laughs> OK, so we're at 10 Lincoln Street. 10 so Lincoln this Street. is it, it's here now? That's where we are, that's my little home. Right. And this so is where... Yeah. It's, we're, how do you get in? You. Well, it's a house. How do you go into a house? You knock on the door, ring a bell, don't you? Right, so it's not like a normal restaurant, really? No, it's not a normal restaurant. Everything here is different. So you ring the bell yeah. to get in. Right, OK. Let's see how it goes. I don't know. Why do you do this? Why do I do this? When we first came here, six and a half years back, we were walking on Sloan Avenue, and we went to the boutique shops. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked, yeah. After it's worked. you. After you. Yeah. But Michael here for lunch. Really nice to meet you. And you, and you. This really is a quite remarkable place. It feels just like a normal domestic house. Behind me there, I'm guessing, was the conservatory and the dining room. And just over there, probably the original living room. No walls have been knocked down. It feels just like a normal domestic house. Now, even more remarkably, because this is an ordinary house, the kitchen, where all the award-winning dishes are prepared, is also the size of a normal domestic kitchen. Tell me, when other major chefs come in here, mm. are they surprised at the size of the kitchen? I mean... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had both uh, Gordon and uh, Marco Piovai. They've come on. Sorry, Gordon, Gordon Ramsay and Gordon Ramsay, uh, Marco yeah. Piovai. They're both friends of ours. And Gordon stood right here and he said, Tandoori, it was too hot for him. Yeah. And he said, where do you cook? And I said, this is where we cook. And he couldn't believe it. That in this kitchen, you have a pastry being done, which is cold, and the desserts, and a hot section. And there is no issue. There's nothing here which is extravagant or flamboyant style kitchen. It's a very basic kitchen. I think it's what you do with it. So everybody at home or in an ordinary kitchen, there's, that's no barrier to... No, there should not be a barrier. It is how much flavour you can incorporate or how much flavour you can bully out of food. That is the trick. OK, let's bully some flavour out. Okay. out. <laughs> we were coming to the kitchen to work. We, well, to be truthful, mainly him, were due to cook one of his signature dishes. Spicy cod, chili marinated in chilli, garlic and lemon. And because the fish is too chunky, it will not really go inside. Mm -hmm. So it's best to just give it a, a little rub, gently on that. You want to do that for me? Yes, yeah, sure. OK, OK. So this is my job. Just and keep rubbing that on. Feel free to taste it. You find it a bit salty. OK. You have to taste as you go. It's yeah. quite salty. And it's it's quite salty, yeah. But when you cook it in the pan, the yeah. flavour goes off. Again, people think Indian food has to be chilli hot and spicy. It is entirely up to you of how you want to eat it. If you don't like too much chilli, cut your chilli down. So then, it down. So Indian food, a lot of us think Indian food curry, mm -hmm. that's wrong and hot food. No, there are certain parts of India where the food is very spicy and some parts it's not. Vanit has just gone out to get some other ingredients for this dish, but it turns out that what we think we know about Indian food, we very probably don't because the origins of Indian food, well, they're a story unto themselves, and they're not entirely what you might think. The Mughals came from Persia and Iran to Afghanistan, and when they came from them, they got their food with them. So if you look at the old cuisine, the biryanis, the kebabs, the tikka, they're not really Indian. They come from Persia. I say, so what, all those, a lot of dishes that yeah. we think are absolutely... Hardcore Indian yeah. are, are not really. They come from that part of the India, of, 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 of the world, it's from Persia and they got it with them. But when they came to India, India was a land of milk and honey and herbs and spices. And that's what they used. They translated those foods with their own flavors. So the sheik kebabs you get, the chicken tikkas you get, the tandoor chicken you get, has all been modified over centuries. And that's what we're getting now. The whole kitchen may be reassuringly humble, but the fact is that the clientele he serves from here are anything but. This is a great honor for me, isn't it? Because I'm guessing that to get a, a private meal cooked by you. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here. Well, no, I'm, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is a, a huge pleasure. But I'm guessing that, that you cook for some fairly important people, do you? We do. Yeah. We do. Uh, we have a lot of people, uh, but you never find a paparazzi outside. Yeah. Because you never let anybody know. So it's all very, very hush-hush. all hush. very, very hush-hush. We, we have royalties, we had uh, royal families from around the world. 
a lot of media personalities from around the world, but not a word goes out. It's like a door is shut. What remains in, remains in. Nothing goes out. That is the beauty of the front door. We've had sniffer dogs in the place almost every week just to check the place out. So people are paranoid. The royalties are paranoid. They want to know what's happening. So they send guards in there. We have tasters standing here before food goes on top. We have all that tomato going on. Oh, you, what? So, so sometimes you, you cook it here and then somebody's tasting it in case it's before been it goes poisoned. Out. Yes. So that really happens? Yeah, it happens. It does happen. And do you go sometimes to sort of palaces to cook? It has happened, yes. It has happened, it yes. It has happened. You are asked specifically to come down. That must be quite nerve-wracking, is it? No, no, is not it? at all. They're actually quite laid back and relaxed. And it's fun for us. You just go in there, you cook your food, hallelujah, you walk out, it's fun. Right. You get to see a palace. <laughs> <laughs> just stick it in. After the break, lunch is ready in what Vineet believes is now the food capital of the world. The whole reputation of British food has been transformed due to the work of chefs like him and the many others who've made Britain their base. And the menus are only getting better. Welcome back to London, where we're with multi-award winning Indian chef Vineet Bhatia. He began cooking in India, but was always anxious to have an international career. There are few, if any, more multicultural countries than Britain, so it was always going to be an attractive place to settle. At that stage, I had various offers in my life. I had an offer to go to Tokyo, to Bangkok, Dubai or London, and I chose London. And not because of the food scene or anything else, but because of Heathrow Airport. Because of Heathrow Airport? Yes, because right. I could see so many planes. <laughs> <laughs> so I came here and I That's came... That's the most bizarre story <laughs> I've ever heard. And I came in here because of the airport <laughs> and because of the weather. And London was perfect. It so <laughs> happened to happen that London had fantastic food being yeah. procured. Because being Heathrow, they were importing it from around the world. Yeah. So you had great produce. It's because of, it's not just the look of Heathrow, which obviously is lovely. Yeah. It was Especially also, now. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it's very useful because you get the produce from all over. And you know what? We used to live in Chelsea. Yeah. I used to live on the fourth floor. And from my living room window, every evening, if you look out of the sky, you will see the Concorde fly at five o'clock in the evening. Right. And it was a dream for me to watch. You know, a lot of people don't like living under airports. This was far. This was far. It was in okay. Chelsea. But yeah. I could see from my window the flight coming from New York. Right. The Concord landing. And I just love London. I just love London. It's home for me now. It's given me so much. It's a country I have adopted or they've adopted me. It's a country I chose to come here. And I think it's given me so much in my life. It's brought me such a high level in my profession that I can't thank it enough for what it's done for me. If it wasn't for London, I don't think I would have grown as a chef anywhere on the world. And the British, the English love the Indian cuisine because yeah. of the link with the Raj in so many years. So they understood it. London, not just Indian food, it is a cultural, uh, it's the cuisine capital of the world, I would say. It used London's to call, the cuisine capital? Yeah, I definitely say that. It used to be New York a few years back, but London has picked up dramatically in the past 10 years. It has really come up dramatically. The kind of uh, cuisines you get here, the kind of uh, different scenarios of cuisine culture, the food you get here is phenomenal. You name it and you get it here, and good quality. There's so much option now. You could be spoiled for choice. You can have a meal for two weeks in a row and have all two different meals, lunch and dinner, different restaurants with different cuisines. It's there. There's so much option now here. So what I have seen from my point of view, my cuisine is, my cuisine is now, it's evolved over the past 17, 18 years and people begin to appreciate that. I was the only one trying to do food at that stage. We had a tasting menu or trying to put food into a nice yeah. plate and make it look appealing. But now there are a lot more restaurants who are trying to get into the same scenario because it has worked, it has proved itself. And what is taking time? Nothing happens overnight. These days, of course, being a chef is becoming increasingly fashionable. Maybe not quite rock stars, but the best in the world certainly have major celebrity status. It wasn't quite like that when Vineet was starting out. 
to go into a hospitality as such or hotel was a big no-no in India. I mean, all the discards went in there. Yeah. All the creme de la creme in India went out to become an engineer, doctor, or surgeon, or defense services. So when I went in to apply for hotel school, my mom and dad asked me, do you want to work in a hotel? Do you want to clean a toilet? Do you want to make beds? Do you want to peel potatoes and garlic? And I said, yes. Yes, yes, yes. to all of those. I said yes, because I was never a sheep from day one. I always wanted to have my own path and make my own way. It's funny how it's turned out because now this is the era of the celebrity chef mm -hmm. and you're suddenly in a, in a glamorous industry. I don't see that in Michael. I mean, I don't even consider myself as a celebrity chef. I just consider myself as a cook. A, a celebrity chef is a glorified cook. That's what he is. It's up to you whether you want to go on the telly or don't want to go on the telly. I'm very happy sitting in my kitchen and doing my restaurant around the world and being very focused. I am not ready for that. I'm very happy going to the airport without wearing uh, sunglasses on a hat. And right. getting so you like to be anonymous if I like you can. I like to be anonymous if I can. Obviously, you do recognize. I mean, they are insensitive. I mean, Abu Dhabi yesterday, I mean, the day and just a few days back, I walk into the hotel there, I go down to the buffet, pick up my food, and I come down, and I go back for something else, and the guy says, uh, did you enjoy your meal, chef? I'm not in a uniform. I'm in a desert. And I looked at him and I said, uh, how do you know I'm a chef? He said, of course I don't know who you are. I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that. So it comes with a certain baggage. Back in the protective shroud of the kitchen, the fish was pretty much done. It's clear this is where he gets his greatest sense of fulfillment. Just the joy in seeing in your guests' faces, the delight of saying, oh, that was nice. I enjoyed it. Eat mouthful was beautiful. I mean, that really gives me a kick. It's not getting the Michelin star or the critics coming in and saying, you know what, this clever food or whatever. It is when you come and eat here as a normal punter and say, you know what, fantastic, you've made my day. There is something just enormously satisfying, isn't there, in, it in is. cooking and it the is. whole thing of eating together. I don't know, yes, what, it yeah, is, every it's, civilization is, yes, is, is It brings based people on... together onto a table or onto a, a platform mm. where you come together. And you, you see very often people sit down and they're having the, the meal yet to come and they sit down and the food comes in there and they begin to eat and it goes quiet. Everything is fast, silent. All you hear are knives and forks. And that's a good sign for you? It's a very good sign for me. That's the best music you can ever hear. Thinking of the glasses, the cutlery, the laughter. That for me is music in restaurants. It's escapism. It's a journey of spices, a magic ride of spices when you come to the restaurant like ours. You really feel the passion has come through, the soul comes through in the place. To accompany the spicy fish, basmati rice with coconut milk and some cashew nuts to add texture, and some butter right at the end. And that, my friends, is the dish. What's it called again? It's not ready yet. Oh, it's not ready yet, sorry. It's not ready yet. I've, I've jumped the gun. What's you jumped the here? gun. That's a chutney. Presentation is, he thinks, critical. Even the plates are meticulously chosen to provide the food with the best possible canvas. And for this dish, some purple potato chips. And yes, apparently, you can get purple potatoes. These are my variations. These I mean, you, would, you would get that into something similar in my restaurant in Bombay, mm -hmm. which we have two of now. You would get something similar, but with local fish. That is, but that the is fish tremendous. Is nice. It's just flaked off, you can see. Yeah. It's just opened up very beautifully. I tell you what, it's the marinade, really, that, you know, whoever you've got putting on that marinade, <laughs> if I were you, I'd sign them up just like that. I mean, it's extraordinary now because you have, what, 14 restaurants around the world? 12. 12. 12 restaurants around the world. But it was quite hard for you to start off, wasn't it? I mean, it's Oh, it was. I mean, uh, when we first opened our Rasoi, uh, we had no money to open the restaurant and we had to give our house collateral to the bank to raise funds. It took us three years for us to open our first restaurant outside Rasoi, like right. two years. And the past two years, it's just gone rapid fire. People keep coming to us all the time, open up, open up. And now we are stepping back saying, no more, no more, hold it. We right. don't want to do too many and dilute ourselves. But we're very selective of what we take now. Because each one we take is very precious to us. It's like a new baby. And it's a hard grind. It's long hours, anti-social life. But that's what I do for a living. That's what I enjoy the most. And this is what I'm most comfortable in, the chef uniform. And Rasoi is the training ground for us. Everybody trains from here and is then taken over to various projects around the world. But this is the mothership. This is where it all starts. This is where it all happens for us. So this little kitchen? This kitchen. This kitchen is the start of the well, it's of the thing grand. Yeah, rapidly becoming happy. a global empire, isn't it? Well, I don't know if it's an empire or not, but uh, we're happy. 
It's worth pointing out that partly due to the relatively low value of the pound right now, prices in Venite's most prestigious restaurant are far lower than you'd pay for anything similar in most parts of the world. Incredibly, really, the methods used in this little kitchen are now being exported around the world. I wondered how he was going to make sure that his international restaurants stayed true to his philosophies. A lot of the places uh, which we have have got webcams for us to keep an eye on the really? kitchen. Really? So you actually can watch? Yes. I can watch it from oh, a laptop yeah. anywhere in the world. I log on, we have a specific codes and keys, we log on and we just check randomly. It could happen. I could be sitting in Mauritius and check in what's happening in London or what's happening. I mean, we don't have a camera in London, but Geneva we have it, Mauritius we have it, Bombay we have it. All the new restaurants we're opening up, we all make sure we have webcams in them. That's one of a part of a contract. We will have a webcam to monitor it. But the key thing is the personnel, the team you put behind. The engine room has to be super solid. Nothing changes on the menu without my permission. Nothing. You cannot have one garnish from here to there. I'll flip. I have to. Because yeah. if I want to maintain consistency, I have to be very stiff to my staff. And they respect that. Because they've been with us for so long, they understand where we come from, they understand what we need from them, and they deliver. And touch wood, we have been very uh, good with the team, and we've had staff staying with us for a very long time. You've come a very long way. Mm. Where do you want this to end? I mean, do you see this as a big global super chain, or...? or? No, um, things worked in our favor. It happened. We have never gone out, given our business card, and said, open me a restaurant here, open me a restaurant there. We have never done that. It's purely on referral of people who have come to us and asked us. We've come to a stage in our life where now we actually cherry pick and say, I want this project, I don't want this project, I will not do this. And believe me, Michael, if I cannot do a project, I will not touch it. If I cannot deliver a project, I will not touch it. I let it go. People throw a lot of money at us to do projects and we just say no. It is not a question of money. It's a question of giving a product and delivering what we are and maintaining it. And if you can't, we just say, I'm sorry, we can't do it. We literally turn down offers every fortnight. Vineet, that's a fantastic policy. Thank you so much for being on the programme. It's Thank been great. You. Thank oh, you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Next week is the beginning of a new series of Peshad's business people. And first up, we're building on a huge scale. Meet the global chief executive of Australia's biggest development company. Steve McCann of Lendlease talks about their massive work at home and overseas. That's all next week.